It's Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's very good to be with you this morning to share together and learn from God's awesome word. And I really hope that you find uh, this message encouraging. Now we just heard some powerful words there from Matthew and John. Uh, did you see them? Did you see any word pictures in this reading? Maybe you could see John with his garment of camel's hair and a leather belt, crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. Maybe you could visualize that crooked road being made straight as a highway for Jesus to come on up into Jerusalem. Maybe you could see crowds of people taking the winding road down a thousand meters or three thousand feet from Jerusalem down to the Jordan River to be baptized, to be immersed in water by John. Maybe you could see an ax at the root of, of a mighty tree, like that pistachio tree in the picture. The picture I really want to focus on with you this morning is in, uh, in verse 12. We get a very powerful picture of Jesus here. He starts by saying his winnowing fork is in his hand. Well, what's a winnowing fork? Well, a winnowing fork was a, was a tool that farmers would use to scoop up grain and throw it into the air. Well, why would you do that? Well, the winnowing fork, by the way, is also known as a winnowing shovel. That may make more sense to us, or a winnowing fan. And it was an instrument that had sometimes wide wooden prongs on it. So what you would do is the, uh, the grain would be laid on the threshing floor, and you would pick it up and throw it into the air. And what would happen is the wind would tend to blow the chaff to one side and the heavier grain would just fall straight down onto the threshing floor. Israel's in an interesting position because it's at the intersection of four different uh, climate zones. So there's always some kind of a wind blowing, especially in the hotter weather of the harvest season. So the farmers would make a threshing floor which could be a broad area, usually out somewhere between a field and a barn. It could be made out of stones, uh, pavement, or it could be just rolled earth. And around the edge, there would be a little lip to keep the grain from blowing out when it fell down. And if they did it in a barn, they would put a board across the door. That's the, the reason we have this word threshold is to hold the grain in for the threshing. I'll give you a couple of pictures here. Of what? So here's what a threshing floor uh, could look like. You see the, the, the paved area with the, uh, with the lip around the edge. And sometimes animals would be engaged to trample down uh, the, the grain to loosen the chaff from, from the grain itself. Another interesting thing is uh, threshing floors were very important in the history of Israel. Remember the, uh, the uh, relationship of 
Ruth and Boaz had a lot to do with, with threshing floors. And of course, they're ancestors of Jesus Christ. One of the most interesting is that in Jerusalem, David bought the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. The threshing floor of Ornan became the location of the temple that God built where he was going to manifest his presence in a special way. So Solomon built a temple over this threshing floor. And an amazing thing that happened almost a thousand years later is this is the location where God opened up his promise of salvation to the Gentiles in a great harvest of the world. The other thing we notice is that it talks about uh, Jesus gathering his wheat. And I just love the way it points to the fact that his, his, this is his wheat, that he's going to gather into his barn, and the chaff, which is blown off to the side, is going to be burned up uh, with unquenchable uh, fire. The separation of the righteous and the wicked, of course, was a theme that would resonate in the minds of his Jewish hearers because if you think back to Psalm 1, and, and as you move through the Psalms, this theme of how to live as a righteous person versus the fate of the wicked is, is, a, is a very dominant theme in the Old Testament. So this idea of, of, of separation would, would be very important to, to them. And this is maybe one reason why uh, Matthew starts his, his gospel out this way. But I need you to enlarge your vision a little bit because we're not just talking about Jesus working on a little threshing floor. We're talking about the whole wide world uh, that Jesus will be uh, coming back uh, to redeem and to separate uh, those who have loved him and those who he wants to be in his barn. So where are you in this picture? I think that Christians are the wheat, obviously. You're the, the precious grain that Jesus wants to save. And also, a nice thing about wheat is it's also seed. It regenerates. It brings life. And you remember further on in the Gospels, Jesus said that unless a grain of wheat falls down to the ground, it can't produce a crop. So that's, that's all part of this process. Another amazing thing that I found out is that part of the reason God gives us powerful image at the beginning is God's goal is to gather us into his barn and to share his glory with us forever. Now, this is a little diagram here of the occurrence of the word glory in the Bible. And what do you notice about that? You'll notice kind of a crescendo uh, toward the end of the Bible as the emphasis on glory uh, keeps building and building. And that's part of the purpose that God has for us, is to be with him forever, but to share his glory. All right, so why, why do we have this picture here at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew and the beginning of the New Testament? Because really, this is a picture of Judgment Day. You know, that, isn't that sort of the last day? That's toward the end, right? The revelation and, and all of that. So why, why is it up here at the front? And by the way, Judgment Day uh, for, for God is, is a happy occasion for his people. This is the time that he, he unites with them. But uh, why is this image here and, and what can we do with it? What, what, do we, what do we take home from this? Well, one of the things that may help is that this is an apocalyptic vision, all right? And what's that? An apocalypse is simply a revelation, all right? So you, you've seen movies like Apocalypse Now, etc. An apocalypse is a revelation, and that's the book, that's the name of the book at the end of the Bible, which is the apocalypse or the revelation of Jesus. I was amazed to find out that when you read through Matthew, Matthew has about 37 apocalyptic passages in the 28 chapters of his gospel. And I was amazed when I started thinking about that. You know, I often, I always use in my mind, I sort of think that was something for the end. But his, his gospel is saturated with these images, even in the middle uh, of his gospel. And I think part of the purpose is to kind of lift our eyes, you know, to this horizon of glory that Jesus wants us to focus on. 
And there's all kinds of things that that can help us do. It can help us have hope in the middle of persecution, which was a reality for so many Christians in the New Testament era. It can also give us a vision of where we're going. And I think another important thing is it also gives us purpose. You know, for why, why are we here? You know, we have a future. The other thing that I, I thought uh, is interesting here is that Luke adds some interesting information to this account in the third chapter of his gospel. And by the way, have you noticed that this apocalyptic vision is occurring in the New Testament even before Jesus' ministry starts? Before he says a word in his ministry, we have this vision of him. Also, it occurs before his death, his burial, and resurrection, you know, for the forgiveness of our sins. So Luke adds some interesting information in his chapter uh, 3, uh, where he has basically the same account. But he says this, um, and the crowds were questioning him, saying, then what should we do? In response to the messages of, of John the Baptist. There's three groups here, the crowds, the tax collectors, and the soldiers. So what he says to the first group is interesting. He said, he would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. So what's the message there in principle for us? This is about compassionate living. This is about sharing what we have. It's about recognizing the needs of others and doing things in practical terms. This is very down-to-earth stuff here, okay? Coupled with this vision of Jesus on the horizon. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he answered them, and he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to do. So what does that have to do with us today? Well, how about honesty in our dealings? How about honesty in the workplace? How about respecting the instructions we're giving and answering the temptations we may have to fudge a little bit on our taxes or whatever? And then he says uh, to the third group, some soldiers were questioning him and saying, what about us? Uh, what shall we do? And to them he said, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content uh, with your wages. Contentment is a major important theme in the New Testament. Um, here we see it in, in the Gospels. Even before uh, Jesus begins his ministry, we see it in the, in the teachings of Paul that godliness when, with contentment is, is great gain. So I hope what I want you to see here is there are some really practical applications that John is giving along with this vision. We have a vision of Jesus exalted, eternal, reigning as the King of Kings. And that's not just a faraway thing, okay? That's meant to help us today to live up to the, the vision that we have. So let me suggest one thing. If this is all in the background of your mind, right? It's kind of on the back burner, or maybe it's off the back burner, maybe it's fallen down behind the stove, right? It's kind of, that's for a faraway time back there. Maybe what you need to do is pick it up and turn around and put it out front. I think that's the point that, um, that John wants us to see, is the vision of Jesus on the horizon of the glory needs to be in our foreground, not in our background. Now, in the middle of these uh, visions uh, in the gospel, and I mentioned there were quite a few of them, there's a part between chapters 11, 10 to 11 to 13 or 14. And there's a lot of stuff there about Jesus coming back, his preparation for his disciples in this regard. He cast down some pretty strong words on unrepentant cities of Galilee in Chorazin and Bethsaida. Um, and right in the middle of this intensity about who is Jesus and all of this imagery of him coming back, there's this beautiful little invitation. And I think you're all familiar with it. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble in heart, 
and you will find rest uh, for your souls. The other thing I, I think is so important about Jesus that he always leads by example. So after verse 12 of Matthew 3, we have this account where Matthew records, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. At the end of his gospel, Jesus asks that his disciples take this vision and they go into the world and they make disciples of others and they baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You remember in verse 11, what did John say about Jesus? He will come and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And fire in this sense is not the sense in that unquenchable example for the chaff, okay? This is the fire of purification. This is the fire of the refiner's fire that Jesus wants uh, to bring uh, to those who want to follow him. And what happens in baptism is that the fire of the Spirit uh, unites with us as we're immersed in the water. And at that point, we are united with Christ in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. This is the, the starting point of the pathway to glory. And if you're on that pathway, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, uh, please consider that today and come uh, forward in a few minutes after we sing our clothing song. I mentioned that uh, Jesus loves to, uh, or Jesus is a, a fantastic teacher because he leads by example and he always does beforehand what he asks us to do. Okay. He, if Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, the encouraging thing is he's already done that, right? He's already died on the cross um, for us. So the, the instruction that he gives is, is something that he's, he's already done. If he asks us to go into the world, something he's already done. He's already left his home and come here. A friend uh, and a, a great teacher I admire who teaches counseling he uses uh, the model of Jesus in his teaching. And one of the things that uh, Bill Flatt pointed out is that Jesus uh, really frequently gives homework. Have you noticed that? Go and do this. You know, go and tell somebody. Go and sell this and do that. And so uh, the homework I'm going to suggest today is um, why not skim through the, re the New Testament? Or if you're reading it regularly, why not try to focus and just pick up on some of these passages that we're talking about uh, that give you this vision of Jesus on the horizon of glory. A few years ago, a number of us gathered at Camp Oma, and we did this. We spent a week just reading through the New Testament and focusing on all of these passages that lift our eyes up uh, to this horizon of glory. And I'm, I'm truly, truly sure that you'll be blessed uh, if you do this. I want to conclude with uh, just a, a very quick overview of some of the highlights of this. Because I think what you see as you, as you go through the New Testament is just how powerful uh, these visions are. And it starts right there at the beginning of the Gospel. And then you'll notice uh, that Jesus calls Peter and James and John up to a mountain. And you know what happens there, that Jesus is transfigured before them and they see his glory and then when you move into the book of Acts in chapter 1 you see a, a vision of Jesus being lifted up to heaven through the clouds with the promise that he's going to come back 
in the same way. Move to Acts chapter 7. You see Stephen give an amazing speech where he recounts the history of the whole Old Testament uh, from the time of Abraham to the coming of Jesus. People are so incensed that they, they, they kill him. But just before he dies, he says, I see heaven open and he sees the Son of God sitting at the right hand of God. Oops. If you go over to uh, chapter 9, you'll notice Paul has a vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus. He later says in Acts 26 that I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. That vision stuck with him all his life and it inspired him to live through all kinds of obstacles. If you move over to 1 Corinthians 15, you'll notice an incredible vision of Jesus victorious delivering up the kingdom uh, to his God and Father who is in all and through all and over all. And then you go over to Thessalonians and you see these incredible visions of Jesus coming back uh, to, to make sure there's justice uh, for his saints who have suffered in his name. And then in the incredible book of Hebrews, you see Jesus victorious and this vision of him in heaven, surrounded by all of his faithful saints uh, in the church of the firstborn. And finally, at the end of the New Testament, in the, in the revelation of John, in the apocalypse, you get the most powerful visions of all. God saves the best till the end, right? And John has this blessing promised in, in, in verse 3 of Revelation 1. And this is, this is what he says. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. So there's a blessing in being aware of these visions and doing them and living our lives out in, in light of them, letting them inform our decisions, whatever it is. It's about our career, it's about moving, it's about buying something, it's about knowing what to do, how to treat others. All of these visions uh, can inform us. So here we have John the Baptist at the beginning and John the Apostle here in Revelation uh, 1. And I just want to close uh, with this vision that John gives us in Revelation 1. Uh, from 12 down to 16. He says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle, and his head and his hair were like white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze, when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength.